Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, dear audiences here and online with a slight delay, welcome to our diversity day ceremony, uh, which always comes at the end of the European Diversity Month under the patronage of uh, the European Commission. So this event is hosted uh, by Business Society with uh, the support of Manata, Philip Morris and Provident as partners. Um, and I want to also thank uh, our media partner, Heroin Magazine, and uh, I kindly thank Marketa Pekarova Adamova for her patronage of the event. Uh, my name is uh, Marketa Schwarzkowska. I am a PR manager, I work in communications. Uh, uh, in the recent years, I specialize in sustainability, gender, and immigration issues. And uh, we are going to spend about half a day together. Uh, this event does not end with lunch. I will let you in on what's ahead of you later. After the introduction, we will have a panel, a discussion panel. Then in part two of today's conference, after the break, then we will um, be witnessing the ceremony of accession to the diversity charter. 11 companies are joining, then we'll break for lunch. And after that, we will break out into sessions, uh, smaller sections, uh, and we'll be talking uh, about uh, uh, hot topics such as uh, pay transparency, the future is female, and second and third career. So please stay with us after lunch. Diversity is a word that's going to be reverberating around this uh, hall throughout. So let's make it more more pre present and relevant to our own selves. Uh, don't worry, that's nothing difficult. Please raise your hand when you find what I say relevant to you. One. Is there a, anyone uh, whose uh, mother tongue is not Czech, but who works and lives in the Czech Republic at present? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there anyone who is pre currently on parental leave? Has anyone here been on parental leave? Do you or anyone from your family uh, have a handicap, a disability, or are you a carer, or were you a carer, or your family, are they carers for disabilities? Thank you. Uh, do you have amongst your friends uh, LGBTQ people? Is there anyone here who primarily uh, is left-handed? Is there anyone who has not raised his hand? Not a, uh, Thank you. This was a little exercise. I hope you, uh, it's a fine with you. I just wanted to uh, point out with this that diversity is not only about uh, gender equality or, or uh, equal opportunities for various ethnicities. Uh, races, etc. because we all want to feel welcome, we all want to feel a part of society, and uh, for instance, uh, uh, left-handed people were slightly discriminated against when they were not uh, able to use scissors as, as uh, freely at school uh, uh, or easily. Or if you're a parent, you may find it difficult to access some services or even transport. So we all have some um, past uh, reminiscence of uh, unequality. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, welcome to uh, our conference. The first to speak 
through video is Margaret Karova Adamova, who is uh, on an important business trip to the US, but she has not forgotten about uh, about us, and uh, she sends Vítám her greetings through video. Vítám vás srdečně jmenem svým a také jménem poslanecké sněmovny na Mezinárodní konferenci Evropský den diverzity 2023. Stalo se již hezkou tradicí, že tuto prestižní událost hostí poslanecká sněmovna parlamentu České republiky a jsem moc ráda, že jsem mohla Evropskému dni diverzity v letošním roce znovu poskytnout svoji záštitu. Bohužel v němé pracovní povinnosti ve stejný čas, jako se koná vaše konference, zavedly do Spojených států amerických na pracovní návštěvu a proto vás tedy jenom takto srdečně zdravím online. Květen, jak všichni víte, je již tradičně s podporou Evropské komise Evropským měsícem diverzity. Tematickým a programovým vrcholem pak bývá právě Evropský den diverzity. Evropský měsíc diverzity posiluje a rozšiřuje informace vědomosti o diverzitě a inkluzi na pracovištích a v celé společnosti. Evropský měsíc diverzity je oslavou úsilí a vůle zaměstnavatelů a veřejných institucí pomáhat budovat rovné, nediskriminační a inkluzivní pracovní a společenské prostředí. Evropský den diverzity je vždy pozoruhodnou událostí propagující diverzitu a inkluzi jako důležité společenské hodnoty v naší společnosti. Konference i pravidelně ukazuje na důležité trendy pro trh práce v oblasti diverzity, flexibility a inkluze a také nejlepší praxe odpovědných firm a zaměstnavatelů, zejména z řad signatářů Charty diverzity. V rámci Evropy, a to nejen v zemích Evropské unie, se k Chartě diverzity již připojilo téměř 14 400 zaměstnavatelů, což reprezentuje přes 17 milionů zaměstnanců a zaměstnankyň. V České republice se k hartě diverzity připojilo již více než 120 signatářských společností a firm, což dohromady obnáší přibližně 250 tisíc zaměstnanců a zaměstnankyň. A pozitivní je, že zájem firm a společností o diverzitu a inkluzi se nadále zvyšuje. Ráda bych srdečně poděkovala všem odpovědným firmám a společnostem, které prosazují diverzitu a inkluzi na svých pracovištích, a svojí příkladnou praxí vytváří otevřené a vstřícné pracovní prostředí pro nejrůznější skupiny lidí v práci. Mimo jiné pro rodiče, ženy, mladou generaci, starší generaci, handicapované, LGBT+, zahraniční zaměstnance v České republice, včetně těch ukrajinských, kteří k nám přišli z válečných zón v důsledku ruské brutální agrese vůči Ukrajině. Děkuji také biznesu pro společnost za jeho dlouholeté úsilí při prosazování charty diverzity v České republice. Přeji vám všem inspirativní den a blahopřeji novým signatářům charty diverzity a těším se na další setkání a aktivity v rámci charty diverzity. My děkujeme. Thank you. Now we will continue live. I'm honored to be able to pass the floor to His Excellency Fredrik Jorgensen, Ambassador of the Kingdom of Sweden uh, to the Czech Republic. And as you all know, Sweden is now holding presidency of the EU Council. see that most of those interested in diversity are women, right? <laughs> um, thank you so much uh, for, for the invitation. Thank you so much, uh, Pavel. Good to be here. Uh, we've been working together before. It's a great, great pleasure to, um, to stand here in front of you. Uh, I will be speaking a little bit about um, Sweden's EU priorities. As you know, we are, have taken over the presidency of the EU after the Czech Republic. I'll be speaking a little bit about uh, gender equality, and I will be speaking about uh, inclusion. I have some notes. I don't know whether I will be following these exactly, but we will, we will see. Uh, as we have noticed over the last two years, the world is a dangerous place. And we have war in Europe. Now that Sweden has taken over the, the presidency of the EU, our overriding concern, the, mo the overall uh, greatest objective for us is 
to our friends in Ukraine. They are fighting for their security, for their survival, but they are fighting for all of us. So this is the most important thing we do. And so far, we have been able to maintain that unity in the European support for, for Ukraine. Uh, we are now working on the 11th package of sanctions, making sure that the Russians cannot find the financing for, for the continuation of the war. This is extremely important that we continue doing this. The outcome of, of the war in, in Ukraine is decisive for, for our uh, security all across Europe. Uh, but our economic future depends on our competitiveness. Europe needs to stand up against the competition in the world. In a globalized world, Europe needs to become stronger. And this is also something that we put uh, a lot of emphasis on in, during our presidency, making sure that Europe can compete with the rest of the world. And in doing this, we need to manage the green transition. We are moving into green, leaving coal, gas and oil behind, moving to something else, something more sustainable. And in doing this, we need to make sure that every, everybody is on the train, that nobody is standing on the platform when the train is leaving. And this, where we, this is where we come to, to diversity, to inclusion. We need to make sure that nobody is standing on that platform, because the train is leaving now. And we need to make good use of our resources in doing this, in competing, in moving forward. We need to make use of all the resources we have. And the most obvious case here is to continue working with gender equality. This is the most obvious spot, I think, where we can see that we are not making good use of our resources. This is not only about equality, it's not only about giving everybody a fair chance, it's also about the economy. This is a way of making our economy grow. Estimates have, have been made saying that if we were to work more diligently with uh, gender equality and get women to work as much as men, GDP in Europe would grow with 10%. That's a lot. That means a lot when building our, our societies. You know that Sweden quite often comes out high in those rankings about gender equality. This is due to the fact that we have been working with this for a long time. It takes time to, to get ahead. And we have had some success in our system. Uh, and I can see three uh, decisive uh, policy areas where, where we thought we needed to do something. The first one was to build, to work with childcare and care for the elderly. Otherwise, women tend to take care of the young and the old. So, childcare, that's essential. We need, we need, we needed to, in our system, to abolish joint taxation. If we tax people as individuals, this means that there's an incentive for everybody to work. We also um, need to uh, make sure that both men and women can get parental leave on the same conditions. As the Czech system stands today, it's slightly different. Now, this has been our experience. Whether this suits the Czech Republic, I don't know. But there's a very strong case for moving forward and for comparing notes. The Czech Republic and Sweden has a very strong partnership on, on many, questions, many issues, and we should have that also here. As there's a very good case for, for cooperation. Our countries are big enough to make a difference in Europe. We saw that during your presidency. But we are also small enough to, to realize that we need to cooperate with others. And that, that's a nice combination. So we should be doing more things together, Czech Republic and Sweden. 
Now we see a very positive momentum in this country. Uh, the day before yesterday, a few of us, uh, Monica, were at Narodni Divadlo at this manifestation supporting the Istanbul Convention. The government is now preparing to the process uh, to present those proposals to Parliament. I hope for a positive outcome of that debate. We will see. But, but the important thing is to note that there is a momentum on these questions at the moment. Uh, so please, from my perspective, uh, keep it up. In ending, I would like to get back to where I started, to, to Ukraine. Um, and in this field, this country sets an example, actually, to the rest of Europe. More than 500,000 Ukrainians have come to this country. And of them, now 100,000, roughly, are working and contributing to the Czech welfare state. And that's amazing. We don't see that in many other countries. Uh, in February this year, we had a very interesting seminar at the embassy. Um, Pavel was there as well. Uh, we were listening to private enterprise, to private companies, to hear about their experience, how they help integrating Ukrainians into Czech society. So IKEA and many others, that they could enlighten us and tell about their experience. And that was very useful. And Pavel was very active in, in those discussions as well. Only last week, I visited, together with all my European ambassador colleagues, we went to UNICEF. And we uh, spoke to the uh, Ministry of Health about the work that they do together in integrating Ukrainians into Czech society. And that was really, really impressive. We met those nurses, those doctors that are now getting their exams tested and, and qualified in the Czech system. And from now on, they can move on and work in this country. Again, contribute to society. So the work that you do there was really, is really impressive. This is also a way of, of, of building inclusive societies and diverse societies. How you take care of those coming to you, that's very decisive for how you shape your own society. And the generosity that the Czech Republic has shown in this is amazing. So I want to thank you all for this. It's very nice to, to see this as, as a, somebody working, again, in this country, but, but, not, but not being Czech. What was, what was the question? <laughs> um, I want to commend you for, for this work, and uh, I wish you good discussions. This is really, uh, this is a hot topic, and this, and we see this today. The only way to move forward, the only way to, to face those challenge, challenges that we are, are, are meeting now, is to do this in cooperation with others. Diversity and uh, partnerships. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Excellency, for inspiring words. And now I would like to pass Mrs. Monica Landmanová, the head of the representation of the European Commission in the Czech Republic. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. As a humble Swede, that Sweden uh, holding the presidency to the Council of the EU is the champion in diversity and the champion in gender equality. So I have a pleasure to mention it here. And I will continue in Czech because it is my mother tongue. So welcome to this event that forms part of the European Month Diversity Month. And the President Pekarova has mentioned it. The European Diversity Month is an initiative of the European Commission and its objective is to work with its partners, private companies, you represent individuals and state entities to join this campaign on diversity, on inclusion, explaining why these play an important role. Uh, and the European Commission has committed to fight discrimination and this commitment is based on the principal values of the EU. It's based on the article number two 
of the treaty on the EU that specifies the main European values and apart from democracy, freedom and the rule of law, the protection of human rights, including minorities, is mentioned. And diversity forms part of a broader European vision. And its aim is to point to the positives generated by diversity. The European Commission under Ursula von der Leyen has identified uh, its priority to build the union of equality. That's their main vision. And the underlying message is that everyone in the EU who shares the same objectives should have the same opportunities to reach these objectives. So it's this simple. However, it's not the everyday reality for everyone. Our EU citizens do have to face discrimination. More than 50 percent of those uh, who have certain uh, health de handicap suffer from discrimination. More than 40 percent of the LGBT community uh, experience discrimination. And we want to change that. So the European Commission in 2019 changed the presidency and under Ursula von der Leyen, they drafted a series of strategic documents. I would like to mention setting the initiatives and activities in this field to achieve the union of equality. So the first document is the strategy to achieve uh, gender equality. The second one is the strategy for uh, establishing equal rights for the LGBT community, for people with um, health uh, disabilities. There is an action plan to fight racism and 10-year work plan for the inclusion of the Roma minority. So these documents are valid within the EU and encourage the member states to <clears throat> draft their own national documents and uh, set their own priorities and activities. So I hope that the Czech Republic will and already has um, defined its strategies in these fields. So the EU, EU Commission's activities are based on these framework documents. There are some legislative proposals tabled by the Commission recently. I can mention the Directive on Transparency in Remuneration, and its ambitious goal is to close the gender pay gap. There is a Directive on the Prevention and Fight Against the gender-based violence, and there is also the commitment to fight against hate crime, be it online or offline. And some of these uh, commitments and objectives of the EU Commission require long-term projects and long-term effort, and the Commission is trying and succeeding in achieving uh, their objectives. However, we all of us have this broader commitment and the EU Commission is aware of existential threats generated by the pandemic, by the horrible war by Russia against Ukraine and the climate change, which might be more latent, however, the more dangerous. Therefore, the EU Commission in 2019 set up the most ambitious objective and that's to reach the carbon neutrality, green transition by 2050, cutting uh, carbon emission to zero. It's a very ambitious objective. However, it is possible to achieve that. The main framework decision, the main framework uh, document is the famous Green Deal. Green Deal, and us as the representatives of the European Commission are advised by PR companies not to use this term, the Green Deal, and they tell us that we should uh, change the term into green transformation or green transition. Maybe you would have thoughts on this. So the green transition, it has to be just, and therefore it requires diversity and inclusion. It has to be fair and it cannot be achieved without diversity and inclusion. Therefore, all the measures uh, covered under the Green Deal already contain this social dimension that's so important for uh, the social cohesion. As Frederick mentioned that, that nobody should be left behind. So therefore, in the Commission recommendations, you will find 
and the um, relevant resources needed for gender equality, pay gap, uh, closure, and so on, because many different groups will be involved. For example, people with some disabilities who are endangered or threatened by social exclusion. Women, they are uh, under a lot greater threat due to energy prices and so on. So I would like to mention a few funds uh, relevant in the Czech Republic, the fund for just transformation that's available for those uh, most affected regions that would suffer from this green transformation towards carbon neutrality. So for those uh, that are lagging behind, it's the Karlovy, Vary, Ustetsky, and Moravian Silesian region. Then there is another fund that's under the approval procedure in the EU institutions is the so-called Social Climate Fund. It's going to be available as well, and it is a response to the changes on the European emission certificates market and diversity and inclusion must be always connected and intertwined. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last person to talk with in this uh, section is Pavel Stern, Director of Business for Society. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this year's uh, European Diversity Day. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here with us in this beautiful uh, room. Thank you all for your time. I would like to thank all of our sponsors and partners. Moneta, Money Bank, Philip Morris and Provident. I would like to thank the European Commission for coordinating and supporting the European Diversity Month and Date. I would like to thank His Excellency Frederick Jorgensen for being here with us because he was also present at our UP 2023. Under the great uh, Swedish presidency, he presented their priorities and uh, objectives within the fields of diversity inclusion. I would like to thank Monica Ladmanova for her input and her summary of key issues of European uh, policies and documents in the fields of diversity and inclusion. So I'm not going to talk about this topic any longer because everything has been covered. However, the topic for today is diversity, sustainability, and partnership. And I believe that these three symbolize the synergies between the social and environmental cohesion. Environmental cohesion cannot be achieved without being ready, being trained, having the right conditions in order to achieve the green transition. And surely we will learn more about these issues in the further panels. Our company, Business for Society, is a platform of responsible companies, and we are proud that jointly with us, we have multinationals, great multinationals, as well as local Czech companies. The Diversity Charter is an exclusive society or platform of responsible companies sharing the best values and um, who show their responsibility. We have a rich program this morning with the ceremony of new signatories to this charter. We are going to have 11 new companies included. And in the afternoon, we will have three workshops. All of you are invited. Don't miss them because they will cover those explosive hot topics. So it's the future is female, how to support women in their career and at the labor market. Then we will have the pay transparency, gender pay gap, and age 
related issues in education. We have to talk about these issues. We have to talk about uh, the issues related to the LGBT community. We have to discuss uh, the possibility to establish um, the Institute of Marriage for the LGBT community. So all of those who are involved in the charter are well advanced in these uh, topics. And the Istanbul Convention has been mentioned, and it's broader than uh, the societal governments. However, sexual-based uh, or gender-based violence and violence against women, those topics should be priorities. There should be zero tolerance against such behaviors. So that's all from my side. We don't have enough time. I believe that all the important issues have been mentioned. So I, again, would like to thank the whole team of Business for Society who are scattered around the room for the great organization of this uh, Today, I would like to thank our technical support, and uh, I hope you will enjoy this um, diversity day. And I'm looking forward to uh, meeting you and cooperating with you. Thank you very much. Well, I have been told that we would like to make a photo jointly with His Excellency Ambassador and with Monica Ladmanova, if that's possible, if you would be so kind. So it's a break for all the rest and the photo. And somebody at the reception has left uh, the, a smart watch. So if any of you misses a smart watch, you can turn. And now the main topic of our event, diversity and inclusion. We will have a new main panel of diversity, sustainability, and partnership. And the context is the green transition. I think I can express these words, fair green deal. And before I invite the main members of the panel, I will introduce, explain the main um, content and points covered by these panels, although many issues were covered by Monica and His Excellency Ambassador. However, I have to stress that, that diversity and sustainability are important for inclusion. Therefore, companies who are advanced in these issues can become leaders in societal changes, and they can play important roles in sustainability through their programs. As Monica Landmanova said, the EU is providing vast resources not to leave anyone behind. It's funding. Uh, support uh, to regional development because often regions uh, sometimes are affected negatively affected by this drive to uh, carbon neutrality so the funds would be allocated to digital connectivity clean energy emission cuts regeneration of industrial sites and reskilling there have been many challenges in the past, and some of them maintain, are still with us. COVID, the migration wave, inflation, the energy crisis, and many challenges uh, lie ahead of us, the climate um, problems and climate change. According to the European Economic Forum, within the next five years, we are about to see a significant change in the labor market, 
it will affect at least 25% of all jobs. So education, training, and reskilling will play an important role. So these will be the topics for this panel along digital skills. And we are going to talk about these issues with representatives of our, of our partner companies. We will discuss the experience, the policies, the strategies. So, and Monica Ladmanova will also be one of the members of the panel. So now I would like to welcome the members of the panel, Clara Escobar, HR Director from Moneta Money Bank. Good morning. Yitka Nemechkova, Corporate Affairs Director from Provident Financial. Welcome. And Monika Ladmanova, the head of the representation of the European Commission to the Czech Republic. Welcome again. Josef Grube, Director, People and Culture, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary. Philip Morris, Czech Republic. Welcome. And to start with, I have a question. And it's up to you what you want to cover in your response. It's a general question. So how your companies uh, perceive diversion and inclusion? And could you name the main objectives for the next uh, few years? Clara, maybe you can start. So good morning to all of you. I'm happy to be able to share our experience from Moneta Money Bank and our approach to diversity and inclusion and gender equality. For us, it is a huge business imperative. It's a, an important value for us as a company and diversity and inclusion, uh, those form part of the ESG strategy and the S, the letter S, uh, is uh, related to our employees, uh, to our communities and clients. So diversity and inclusion, they pay, they play very important role, very important roles. And our plans are very ambitious, I believe. And uh, when you have these ambitious um, goals, then you have to focus on them. And we do that not only in trying to have women in our management, but also we are active in supporting the LGBT plus uh, community. We also employ people with disabilities. So our diversity plans do not cover only gender related issues. So Good morning. On behalf of Provident, I have to explain that we are a provider of non-banking loans. So the our core of the core of our business is financial and social inclusion, and we do that through our products. So this is our corporate value that's reflected in our relations to our clients. But our clients may later on become our sales representatives. And our business is based on a traditional English model, a company established in 1880s. So this is, I don't believe this is about specific objectives. I believe that we are well advanced in this. Most of our sales sales representatives are women. So we are doing a good job in this, I believe. And when we talk to our clients, we are in touch on a weekly basis. That's our business model. And we know a lot about our clients. So we know a lot about their 
the communities in which they live, and many of them are in difficult situations. They have to face many difficulties and challenges, be it in the labor market or elsewhere. There are many reasons for that. Some of them may lost their jobs, or they cannot go back to work because they have to care for somebody, or there are some obstacles of a different kind, and they need uh, help and assistance. And therefore, we came up with the invisible project, and we defined 10 groups of people who suffer from some kind of disadvantage and cannot help themselves. And we want to make them more visible for others and to make the assistance visible for them. So it might be difficult to understand why they can't Google NGOs that could help them. However, when you try to put yourself into their shoes, really, the situation for them is very complicated and difficult. Often, the change is very abrupt overnight. They are forced to take care of somebody. They become carers, and they are under huge pressure, and they forget about their own personal needs. And this is one of our biggest projects. It's a cross-cutting um, company project we are trying to build to help our clients and we want our sales representatives to sell in inverted commas uh, this project and we want to involve our employees in voluntary project and we want to explain the message the main objective and i believe that we are successful in this monica well uh I will be speaking on behalf of the European Commission as an institution, not the executive arm of the EU, but uh, just a regular public uh, government institution like any ministry, etc. Uh, let me mention the HR strategy, which the European Commission regularly updates every five years, a part of which is dedicated to diversity, which is something you will find hardly surprising. Uh, but uh, within the EU, geopolitical balance is also important uh, or, uh, when it comes to uh, gender diversity. That means uh, employees, female and male, uh, and their balance in different countries. So um, the EU now has a strategy how to achieve a good balance. Uh, uh, in the EU institutions, uh, Czechs in general, male and female, are underrepresented as a whole, even at the lowest levels uh, and certainly at the highest levels. So in, uh, with, in collaboration with every country, the Commission has agreed on an action plan, in our case, how to improve the representation of uh, Czech nationals male and female check, check, uh, employees and officials uh, in the EU institutions. Uh, it will certainly be very difficult, but it's not impossible. So that's on the geopolitical aspect. Now on gender balance. Uh, uh, you in the business find this uh, a powerful course because you have been on this path for a long time, but uh, the Commission only fairly recently agreed on uh, goals, how to achieve uh, gender balance, and uh, it was only yesterday. And please keep it uh, confidential because it will be released to the public uh, uh, next week. So keep uh, keep shush about it for a while, and that is uh, the goal is to have 50% of women in middle and senior management positions. Uh, in uh, 2019, when the new commission uh, uh, came into office, uh, uh, it was 30 percent, 36 percent, up from 19 on the previous commission, and uh, now we are at 40 percent. So we will soon be reaching the ideal half. Thank you very much for providing a space to a male and non-Czech speaker to the panel. Thank you for creating this inclusive environment. <laughs> At Philip Morris, we have the uh, quite ambitious uh, goal to create a smoke-free future, which means we have been self-disrupting ourselves as a company for many, many years. And that meant we quickly realized that this transformation 
cannot happen without IND being at the center of our transformation. Now, what does that mean? That means that we learned the hard way that we call it IND, that diversity really can only work if you start with inclusion. And that inclusion aspect that we have really focuses on, around, on creating a culture, an environment where everybody, regardless of where they come from, what language they speak, what they look like, um, who they love, um, can contribute and participate that allows us to become a science leader and no longer only a tobacco leader going forward. Now, in addition, that means, though, translated to the reality, equal pay. We were the first one in 2019 um, where we were certified as an equal pay employer, meaning we actually ensure that women and men get paid the same money for the same type of work. And even though this was celebrated as a big achievement, and we heard it earlier, it is still a, a big topic, uh, not only in Czechia, and all over Europe. It was a very difficult thing to do. So, in terms of goals, we will continue to strive forward to create a, an inclusive environment, and at the same time, foster further on the diversity. Yes, gender, of course. Uh, in our uh, situation, we have more than 40% in our leadership are females. And um, we have nine nationalities represented. So it's not only about gender, we want to evolve it also to, to nationalities and other elements to, and bring this uh, going forward. Thank you. Moc díky. Moje druhá otázka by se týkala toho kontextu zelené transformace a nutných. Thank you. Now in the context of green transition and the changes it necessitates, uh, uh, what is the role of your company or institution? Uh, uh, which programs or schemes do you have in place to achieve this overarching objective? Thank you very much. Uh, as for our transition to sustainability, we do have in place an ESG strategy. We have 11 goals uh, broken down into the finest grain of detail. Uh, now, uh, in the context of our workforce, we all know that uh, digitalization in our digital age is uh, something that uh, permeates our lives and uh, we are a digital leader so we shape banking to fit the digital future and we are doing this for our customers but at the same time we work with our employees we offer them upskilling and reskilling opportunities we gradually adapt their skills to our present and always changing needs because our people are those who offer digital banking services to our clients. And we are not talking just about those who develop digital banking products and services, but also those who staff our call centers and our branches. And through them, we teach our clients how to prepare for the digital future so that they are not caught up in the digital trap. And I'm spe specifically referring to the older generations. Thank you for following up from what Clara had said. Many topics are being mentioned, including digitalization, but uh, inclus inclusion means and inclusivity means uh, including also those who are not able to uh, absorb these changes that the modern day brings. You may think that it's not possible that someone does not use this or that, but there are people like that amongst us and they need to be included. For instance, uh, when you are taking out a loan, there must be a, a path for the customer who is not digital and will not be digital. We must not leave them fall by the wayside. That's why we 
uh, constantly strive for our business to be diversified. It's not all about growth, but it's about uh, walking forward together, all of us. And as regards our attitude, our philosophy towards our own people, our employees, I think we have uh, gone quite far and deep. We have reached a level of corporate culture which offers psychological safety. It's, of course, we we do long term uh, development, uh, uh, upskilling, cross skilling, but they also people to feel safe and comfortable with us. They do not need to jump on every new trend, but they want they need to be kept in the picture. Uh, and it's not about squeezing everything out of them and, and sending them uh, to, to a spa for a day. We want them to achieve their own uh, work-life balance and well-being. Okay, psychological comfort and safety, that's uh, very good. Mental health is, after all, uh, a big topic also for the European Commission. And uh, it will be coming out with a new initiative in this area. So uh, the Commission has adopted, as part of its internal greening effort, to, uh, it adopted a document to reduce uh, its own emissions by 33% uh, before the end of 2024. And how do we plan to achieve it? First, through uh, energy efficiency of its own building, we have taken quite drastic measures, uh, insulating, thermally insulating our buildings, reducing the use of printers. For instance, before we uh, all had a printer in their offices. Now we have one per floor. So people think twice about actually printing something and going there to collect the printout. Uh, and you'll find that uh, screens are good for reading documents after all. You don't need everything printed out. It changes your mentality. For instance, uh, we no longer have uh, waste paper baskets in our offices. Now, I do not have uh, the comfort of having uh, a waste basket in my office, and then I think twice about producing waste when I need to walk quite far to the nearest one. So the European Commission is forcing people to change their habits, and it, it applies to all of them, including uh, commissioners. Uh, because I used I used to work at uh, in the cabinet of uh, Commission Vice President, so I know the commissioners were uh, used to getting a thick uh, a dossier of documents marked up, uh, and then Ursula came and said, "No, no, you will all get your personal secure tablet with all the documentation, and you will be reading everything online." I don't see one before COVID in 2019, so many of them were quite surprised. They taken aback by this. And uh, well, some of them still uh, circum navigate this by having their offices to print it out for them, but they cannot bring the the, the thick document file to the commission, uh, to the meeting of commissioners. Also, commission travels a lot, uh, train, air, aeroplane, uh, this has been cut uh, in favor of uh, virtual uh, meetings, and I believe we can meet our target of um, minus 33% of emissions by 2024. It's a massive opportunity, but at the same time really highlights the interdependency between businesses and the government to make this happen. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities with it, but at the same time there are a lot of risks. That a lot of people might be left behind, and we know from the pandemic uh, that a lot of times, most of the time, the weakest of us are the ones that are being left behind. And I think only in the joint partnership uh, between 
uh, regulators, the government, as well as uh, the business, these ambitious targets can be achieved. For us at Philip Morris, and here particularly in, in the Czech Republic, uh, we also have been publishing sustainability reports since 2015. Uh, in our ESG, so environment and social as well as governance aspect, we can give some example where we focused on here in the Czech Republic. In Kutna Hora, we have a factory. More than 1,000 people uh, are employed in our factory in Kutna Hora. And that factory is carbon neutral already because we know what kind of responsibility we carry in the society where we employ, but also where we sell. At the same time, on, on a societal and, uh, aspect, IND is part of that S pillar that we have on, on the uh, not only diversity and inclusion, but also in terms of health and safety of our employees. Uh, in, in a factory, there are a lot of risks in making sure we do that and is at the same time offer at the same time ongoing lifelong learning opportunities for factories in order they are not being left behind from the mega trends of digitalization so are key in order to drive us forward. And of course on, on the governance aspect, knowing the responsibility in the, in the areas that we operate in to continue to be uh, in philanthropic activities and at the same time um, do good of where we can give back. Thank you. Thank you. Já na to teď navážu uh, dotazem, který se týká konkrétních změn, které... Now I will follow up with what are the specific changes that the work uh, or labor market transformation uh, means for your uh, organization. Uh, the landscape will be redrawn, some jobs will emerge, some jobs will... Uh, uh, go away. So how do you think this will specifically demonstrate in your own organizations in the coming period? Well, we are already doing quite a bit in this respect. Uh, the pandemic has accelerated the trend. Uh, for instance, many employers did not bet too much on uh, remote working, uh, that you know people need to be in offices at all times, that papers must be signed. And suddenly, uh, the pandemic showed that it's not always the case. There are ne negative drawbacks to this, too. Um, so countermeasures or balances need to be put in place. And we must uh, see uh, where effectiveness is uh, needs to be boosted, and uh, as things get faster, Green Deal requ requires us to implement changes at a faster rate, and we as people must find a way of coping. So we are offering opportunities of flexible working. A hybrid working that's powerful course and now we are also looking into reducing the time uh, needed for work uh, and how to find uh, a good balance with other life situations and I'm not uh, talking about you having enough time for your yoga this is for uh, this is about a more greater it's about a greater balance this has to do with also the harder things, learning, development, etc. But what has proven to pay off for us is that if you're able and if you're attuned positively to the change, then uh, we appreciate that, and we have to give you, uh, we have to create conditions for you to be, uh, to find your well being. And I want Yosef now to speak so that he does, it's not always the last, uh, if you don't mind. On our side, I think the changes of the labor market has always been there. There have always been a change in generation, so you always had different generations competing for the same space. I think the main difference is that the speed has accelerated. So everything is just going much, much, much faster. Um, and at the same time, 
we as a society a lot of times are not that fast in adapting to that change. What do I mean by that? Uh, a good example would be what I mentioned earlier, the lifelong learning aspect, where we really invest a lot of time, effort, and resource behind it. And that also comes with the element because the way we still are being taught in school is not that much different than 50, 60 years ago, even though the world around us is very, very different. So again, here it's the responsibility of us, of employers, to maybe be a little bit faster, help out and fill that vacuum that we have with additional offers to not only educate and train employees for the current job, but also for the future. So the aspect of employability, even when people leave us as an employer, but still want to contribute in the society. We see the same thing in terms of uh, our demographics. We're getting older. At the same time, some of the laws have not been yet changed. In some, in some countries even, you know, it is negative for you if you're a, a senior citizen and you want to contribute and go back into the labor force if you want to stay in longer. So here the ability where we then actually want to tap into experience. Experience is important and we would like to have people joining us uh, despite maybe they're a, a more experienced than we usually had in the employment. So again, it comes back to the changes, but always doing it and uh, trying to find the equilibrium between where uh, regulators as well as we as companies can work together to drive us not to the left, not to the right, but forward. Thank you. Moniko, můžete pokračovat? Já jsem jenom čekala, koho vyberete. Well, let me look at this from a different angle. An institution that creates a framework for living conditions by uh, proposing and enacting policies. Then comes something that uh, not anybody could foresee, uh, and I'm referring to the COVID pandemic. So how do we respond? First, you can engage experts and uh, but the relevant DG is a bit of a, you know, bit of a Cinderella amongst all the DGs. And then we were lucky that the DG was headed by a woman who is, uh, and, and, and the commission is also led by a woman. Uh, from the prospective professional area. So a doctor at the head of a large institution. So she knew exactly what to do, that vaccines were important, that uh, borders must be kept open for uh, transport of goods. But that was relatively success. But what to do within the context of the commission, which is very inflexible when it comes to hiring and 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 uh, this gives you just a different point of view on how the commission uh, faces up to the challenges uh, enforced by the changes in the labor market. So because we have to uh, add more flexibility to our own processes, for instance, that we have uh, an extra 60 experts on digital transformation, let's say, when we need them. Thank you very much. Well, Let's talk about a different angle. All the changes we are witnessing are related to process automation in our company. So what used to be done manually in the past, be it uh, bank uh, account statements and so on, everything is automated 
and this changes the structure of our employees and we focus on value added positions or jobs. So this is related to those manual tasks that has been automated and the structure of our employees has changed. And it is really the added value we want to support and develop. The artificial intelligence so far has not been as creative as we humans are. So there is uh, some potential for us uh, with regards to the future. And COVID has shown us that the banking sector can be put online as well. Our branches were closed and we had to change the way we worked and provided services to our clients and we had to ensure security of our transaction and safety to our employees. We had 155 branches and uh, the human resources policy then is very important and we have, all of us have become experts in uh, health related issues and medical issues. So those are very difficult time times and they have changed the human resources policy. And now the inflation and the war also generate pressure because our employees meet clients who are undergoing um, difficult or who have to face difficult conditions and difficult situations. And uh, this is the reason why we have decided to establish a foundation to help uh, the clients who are in difficult financial uh, situations not caused by their own uh, uh, acts and that's something we wouldn't think about in this highly competitive environment in the past but we do really focus on the needs of the clients and our employees and this is the main change that um, is evident so thank you very much and going back to the Ukrainian topic last year when we met we uh, discussed this topic during the event and we should do that this year as well because companies after more than a year with uh, after more than a year we have more experience with the integration of migrants from Ukraine his excellency has mentioned that the Czech Republic has managed to employ more than 100,000 of the migrant immigrants and I, from my experience, can tell you, unfortunately, that we have not managed to keep those people in their profession. So mostly they are employed in a low scale uh, job. So their potential is not uh, used as it could be. However, I would really like to ask you about your approach to employing refugees from Ukraine, because it's an important topic. Well, yes, I can start. We welcomed uh, them and they work as sales representatives for us and we have great experience. They were quite grateful for this opportunity. And uh, of course, in many cases, uh, the educational background could uh, ensure that they could have better jobs and uh, high skill jobs. However, we, that's the opportunity that's available and uh, there is also a language barrier. However, we have to overcome this and give them an opportunity to learn the language. If we don't give them the opportunity, they won't learn. So it's uh, up to all of us. Of course, they sometimes start uh, in a lower skilled jobs. Well, our experience is very limited, I have to say. We have employed only around tens of employees from or refugees from Ukraine. And it is because of the language barrier and uh, because in banking it is quite difficult to employ people without proper um, 
certificates and uh, background and so on. But we have seen a wave of solidarity among our employees. Our employees um, were involved in many voluntary projects. They traveled to Ukraine, provided and supplied assistance and support. So there has been a collection for Ukraine and us and be as the financial institution provided funds towards that collection. Close to us also is a quite personal experience. And I was looking at my watch when you asked the question because I remember on the 18th of May, uh, I received a phone call and somebody said, hey Joe, uh, this is Mikula, do you remember me? And I remembered Mikula. Mikula was an employee in my previous position, not in the Czech Republic, but in Israel, uh, that we had to separate with. So he was no longer an employee, but he remembered me and he knew that I was uh, in the Czech Republic. He was in Dubai and telling me that his wife and two daughters are on the way towards the border of Hungary, if I can help. Um, we were able to bring them over the border. They hosted, we hosted them in a hotel and then united them together here in Prague before they um, started a new life now in Spain. So it's this personal experience, I think, that, that show, uh, again, what we need to do. And again, going back to that that goes beyond our corporate responsibility of, you know, helping out in terms of need. At the same time, on a greater scale, we had a factory uh, in Kharkiv. Uh, this one has been destroyed by now. Uh, more than 4,000 employees. Uh, we didn't lay off a single person for 12 months. We kept paying the salaries. Uh, obviously, the people or employees were not able to perform their duties. Uh, most of them, uh, especially female employees, had left Ukraine by that time. Um, we here in the Czech Republic have still 22 employees uh, from the Ukraine working for us. Uh, we still have uh, primarily female employees that are here with uh, the female side of, of their family uh, and going back sometimes on the weekend, visiting the husband who, who are still fighting. Um, this, this continues to be a, a topic for us. Um, and the Ukraine um, war, I think, is another example. And, uh, um, I was reminded at the beginning for the speech from Your Excellency is that it's not only the war for Ukraine but for Europe uh, about freedom and, and the values that we all uh, believe in. And that means it's, it's worth paying the price and also as a corporate organization to not look at the money but look at the uh, return of the investment as a greater good for society, not only us. These are great stories, and it's um, great how companies and individuals uh, have become involved. As the European Commission, we cannot uh, employ uh, Ukrainian refugees because of the rule that only members of the member states can be employed. And there are a few exceptions, for example, a few Norwegians, but I have never met a single Norwegian employee. But we have tried to provide resources and move resources from different envelopes towards support for the refugees from Ukraine. The Commission has earmarked further funds and money for member states to deal with these issues. And uh, the Commission encouraged the member states to be more active and to adopt the Institute of uh, temporary protection that was in place since 1995, but this is the first time it has been used and uh, it was made more simple for the member states to integrate uh, refugees from Ukraine into the social pensions and social insurance and health insurance sector and at the labor market. And it happened in the Czech Republic. The refugees can be employed. They can register their children in nurseries and schools. The question is what to do next, because this can be renewed for three years. 
So it's valid for one year and it can be renewed three times. This is the second year and probably it will be prolonged for another year. But then the whole EU has to decide what to do with uh, the millions of, uh, Euro of, of Ukrainian refugees. A discussion is going on under Commissioner Johansson from Sweden. So the discussion is going on. She's responsible for migration and internal affairs and is uh, personally involved uh, in these discussions. And because she's great, I believe that this will be successful. Thank you very much to all of you for your inspiring words, for the support provided by the companies. Now we will have a 15 minute break. Nevertheless, first I would like to ask the members of the panel for a joint photo. And I have another piece of information for all of you. So after the break, please come back uh, and connect online. We will have a act for the new signatories of the charter. And please also register into our book and please register for our three afternoon workshops on gender pay gap, the future is female, and age diversity. Thank you very much. Welcome back. I welcome also the viewers online. And this is the accession ceremony. We will proceed with the accession. The European Diversity Day includes a ceremony, ceremony for new signatories of the European Diversity Charter. I will invite Michaela Opotová, member of uh, the Czech Parliament. So, good morning. Welcome to the premises of the Parliament of the Czech Republic. And I am happy to see so many of you. And I would like to thank you for inviting me. I would like to spend the whole day with you. And I would like to participate in the workshops. Uh, unfortunately, I have other commitments. I appreciate highly what you do because you are pioneers in these fields. And what you do is important for diversity and employment in the Czech Republic. And I hope that uh, we will manage to improve the situation here. And um, I can see quite clearly that the situation in companies is better than in the state administration. And I am a mayor and I have a young child and uh, the family work balance is really difficult. And when I see what do you manage? And when I hear about your policies in your companies, it is so great and encouraging. And I would uh, love to uh, reflect this and uh, improve the situation also in public and state authorities. So thank you for what you do. So let's proceed with the ceremony. It, you will be called in the alphabetical order. So first, I would like to invite Petra Neškrabal, Managing Director from Ekeis, Czech Republic. So now we will ask you for your signature. And a few words. 
on behalf of your company. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers. You cannot order companies or institutions to adopt diversity. It requires uh, individual effort and a lot of patience. And I hope that we will manage to do that. Thank you. Now I would like to invite the representative, the golden signatory from Amazon Logistic Sprague, Mr. Schmidt. Unfortunately, I had only one name on my list. I apologize. Ještě, pardon, ta fotografie, jestli by nemohla být s paní poslankyní vždycky. Ještě tak. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank you for this opportunity on behalf of Amazon. And uh, diversity is very important for us, and we are happy to be here. Thank you very much. Now, Deutsche Telekom Services Europe Czech Republic, Pavel, Pavel Jereček, HR Director, and Lucia Stefaniakova. So it's my turn to say a few words. Deutsche Telekom is known and famous for having good HR policy and for taking care of its employees. So today it's a very natural development of our approach to our employees. And as I get older, I realize that my acceptance is not sufficient, that active support is what's important. So that's my take on this, and thank you very much. Next, Heineken Dita Vashichkova, corporate FS manager. Good morning. On behalf of Heineken, I would like to thank you for this open opportunity. Diversity forms part of our culture in Heineken, so I am really happy to be here and to sign the charter on diversity. Thank you very much. Next, Imperial Brands Czech Republic, Katerina Klikarová, People and Culture Specialist, and Dagmar Trnková, People and Culture Partner.
Ladies and gentlemen, we are happy and honored, myself and my colleague, to be here today on the occasion of accession of Imperial Brands to the Diversity Charter. We are mindful of the fact that every business is as strong as its people. We greatly appreciate our employees, colleagues and partners. And our goal is to um, cultivate a corporate culture where everyone feels recognized and welcome. We are looking forward to partnering with companies that share the same values. Thank you very much. And we are pleased to be in the circle. Well, I must refrain from clapping because uh, the microphone feels the reverberations. Now, Iveco Czech Republic, Golden Secretary, Ivana Busova, Country HR Manager. Ladies and gentlemen, hello, and again, I'm too privileged and honored to become with my employer member of such an exclusive circle. Um, what we do, we do with three primary motives in mind. In the Czech Republic, uh, inclusion is not uh, a PR buzzword because we really need to be diverse. We represent over 4,000 employees. We are the biggest bus maker uh, in the country, and we are also developing uh, buses for the future. The second uh, rather personal reason why I'm uh, so happy to be here is that we, as Eveco Group, uh, uh, are on the cutting edge in diversity and inclusion, and we want to be. We want to send a signal also to our partners that we really are that good. And thirdly, uh, regardless of which company uh, I work for, um, I am still a woman who is soon to be 55 plus in a management position with a small child, young child at home that I'm caring for, and I also am carer to a person with disability. So um, really, I did my best uh, to become, for my company to become signatory to Diversity Charter and to qualify for your esteemed company. Thank you very much, and once again, I greatly appreciate you having us. Thank you. Next, Maxion Wheels, Czech, uh, and Ludmila Hadarova, HR Country Director. Hello, everyone. And uh, first, uh, thank you for letting us join the Diversity Charter. Uh, we are a multinational corporation, so we have uh, production facilities on all five continents. So it figures that uh, we deal daily with a multinational um, aspect. Uh, I am not Czech myself, as you can hear. We are based in Ostrava on the border with Poland, so we have. Polish employees, Slovak employees, Ukrainian employees nowadays. And in addition to trying to include these people, uh, we also focus on 55 plus age groups. 
and uh, I hope that uh, by joining the diversity charter, we'll be able to share our best practices and learn the best practices of others. Thank you. I'm not sure whether you have signed our CAPA board. Thank you. And our next golden signature is Orkla Foods, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Andrea Futerová, Ježaj Čudia, and Michal Panocha, Marketing Director. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Orkla, I am very happy that today we are joining uh, the Diversity Charter. We are becoming a signatory. We employ more than 3,000 people in three countries, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary. We uh, make food. We are a food manufacturer. And uh, diversity and inclusion is not just a contemporary imperative, but it is something that helps foster uh, societal values, human rights, and democracy. Thank you. Next. A company, uh, we all have a, a recent Experience with uh, Pfizer, even a Kubelova cluster leader, lead and a uh, leader director is in Europe. For Pfizer. Oh, you've brought a whole delegation. Thank you. So, um, it has fallen upon me to uh, speak. Uh, uh, diversity is not a new topic for me. I'm very happy to be here personally. Uh, we, as Pfizer, deliver breakthrough medicines to patients all over the world. That's why we must be very innovative. Uh, in order to attract innovation, innovation, we must attract good employees. So diversity, equity, and inclusion is a standard in our company. At the same time, we want all our colleagues to feel welcome and to feel comfortable with us. So uh, that's why we're here. We're happy to here, be here. We're happy to become a signatory of the diversity charter uh, and uh, voice our formal commitment to the subject. Thank you very much. Next, Resolve Energy, and welcome Miroslava Kolinska Ambrosieva, HR Manager. So uh, I will speak in Slovak. I can see the advantage of having uh, men, uh, more people here on the stage. Uh, that somebody could talk to the uh, members of the parliament. We at Resolve Energy uh, espouse diversity, something that's very important. Uh, and our parent, Actis, has made the diversity the key pillar of its ESG strategy. At Resolve Energy, diversity 
is not just a, a buzzword. We want to promote diversity not only on the personal level, but uh, in our business too, our business of building solar uh, and other renewable power uh, generation assets. We have 122 gigawatt uh, in production, uh, the largest. Uh, we have currently in progress the largest uh, new projects in Europe. So we are happy to be joining Diversity Charter and we are happy to be in such a company. Thank you very much. And the last of our signatories, Wiener Berger and Christina Wobetska, ESG manager. Hello and thank you for, for having me. I'm very happy to be here. We at Wienerberger, we make building materials and uh, construction is uh, historically uh, or traditionally a very male-oriented business. That's why we want to welcome more women to our industry. We have to debunk myths and overcome biases uh, that uh, are part and parcel with these male-dominated um, areas. Age management is also uh, an issue for us because we have senior colleagues who have been with us for decades, and that's why we try to make them uh, make them well adapted to our present uh, company. When I, on the way here, I thought a lot uh, about diversity um, and. Every time I think about diversity, uh, I feel it would be nice that if my uh, daughter in the future would not need to uh, hear the word diversity, that diversity would just be resolved and nobody would be uh, would be talking about it and, and proposing solutions that it will be antiquated word. Uh, so I hope that uh, we will manage together with our fellow signatories to share and disseminate best practices. So together, uh, we want to say goodbye to you for this part. Uh, but we are looking forward to the after lunch workshops. Uh, we were also asked by uh, Madame Opanova if that if you want to take up anything with her with respect to uh, diversity uh, legislation, don't hesitate to contact her. She's happy to to listen and cooperate. And now over to Kamila Chupanova. She is uh, the main um, person behind, standing behind the organization of today's conference. Well, all of it has been said, really. So I want to thank everyone, all speakers, uh, hosts, uh, guests, uh, partners, our technicians, and thank you again to our partners, uh, Moneta Provident and Heroin and Philip Morris. Um, I hope that you are taking away something, something new, something fresh uh, uh, that you plan to implement your uh, respective organizations and I hope you'll be staying with us and the with diversity and inclusion and so if you're interested we are happy to have you at the one of our uh, upcoming events uh, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing you in uh, our breakout sessions in our workshops 
I want to thank our Business for Society team. The people are interspersed here. They have pulled this diversity event together. I want to thank uh, the Czech Parliament and uh, Madam Pekarova Adamova, the House Chair, for extending her long term partnership. Or patronage. Uh, of this event and as I said the workshops are ready hot topics are waiting to be discussed and in everything we do we uh, like to say that uh, when it comes to diversity, inclusion, and sustainability, our diversity charter signatories lead by example, lead the whole market, the whole country by their example. And um, we also want to be a platform for a dialogue between business and uh, the government, especially between responsible business and good governance because this is a dialogue that needs to be fostered and cultivated new topics need to be laid on the table so that we we'll, uh, put in place foundations for uh, good cooperation in the direction of fair transformation uh, we want a happy future for the Czech Republic and we are looking forward to uh, uh, doing this together with you. Now, enjoy lunch. Uh, see you at our workshops. Uh, I, I bet they will be very interesting. And thank you for giving us your time. Enjoy your break and see you at the workshop. And I thank you, Petra Schwarzkowska, for her hosting of the main session. So um, it looks like uh, the audience is here. Um, thank you very much for staying with us after lunch. Uh, thank you for your interest in pay transparency. The EU is now working on a new directive on pay transparency, which is to address not only uh, the gender pay gap, but also uh, codifies uh, the obligation of companies to publish uh, data if they are uh, if they have a gender pay gap greater than five percent. So, on our panel today, we have Pavlina Kalosova, the Corporate Relations and Communications Director. For the Czech and Slovak markets, Pravozinsky Brazdoy, Martina Kuchova, HC leader, PricewaterhouseCoopers, and Lebka Lenka Houtmanova, Group Country HR Director, Faurecia, Czech Republic. Um, even in 2022, women had to work 60 uh, days uh, more to make up the difference. Uh, uh, to the level of the uh, the earnings of men. So I'm curious to know what are the preparations for the uh, future EU directive. And please let this be interactive. As much as we can, we would like to uh, keep it in the form of a dialogue. Uh, just please use the microphone. I believe that we all have some experience of gender pay gap, uh, even though not all of us realize it and speak about it out loud. So over to you for Polzenski plus Droy. Is everything okay? We 
have to view gender pay gap um, from two points of view. First is the society point of view. Uh, much has been said about about the uh, the reasons for gender pay gap and why we are still accepting of it. And the second point of view is the internal situation of a particular company. Um, and that level does not need to correspond in all instances to the societal level. Uh, we uh, retain PWC uh, to to do a study for us to measure uh, our situation and we uh, qualified uh, for uh, an equal certificate from a Swiss-based foundation. I can later tell you what this was all about, but let me first say that we uh, Pilsanski Prazdroj is the second company to have qualified for this certificate, but I believe more businesses are going through the process of certification as we speak. Uh, but what's more important, a number of the recommendations which have been uh, the product of this uh, mapping or measurement process uh, uh, are being converted into um, actions and policies of Pozensky Prazdroj because uh, only uh, uh, rules that will not let you bypass them left or right can uh, bring you to uh, gender equality. Uh, on behalf of the PWC, uh, let me say a little bit about who we are. We, amongst other things, do these certifications. You know, obviously, it is also within our interest to to certify as many businesses as we as we can. Uh, as an equal opportunity employer, we uh, recruit the same number of. Uh, men and women in terms of promotions. Uh, last year, we promoted 36% of uh, women and only 28% of men. So when it comes to uh, advancement through career levels, uh, we have a very transparent pay structure. We also transparently disclose information what are the pay entry levels for specific management or uh, hierarchy levels. But it's not only about uh, some uh, pay uh, tariffs, etc. But companies, organizations need to talk about uh, uh, pay and be transparent about it. Good afternoon. I represent a company from the manufacturing sector. Uh, maybe my, no, my role is here not to share best practice or uh, things that didn't work out quite well, uh, but maybe I'm here to share our journey. We are a manufacturing company, so uh, we are chock a block with technical positions. That means uh, largely a male dominated environment. So, how do we uplift women in these conditions? Uh, I thought, I always thought, up until the end of last year, that we had no pay gap in our company, but then we uh, were confronted with data. Uh, which hard data which showed that in some positions the gender pay gap was as much as 16%. This completely opened my eyes. We also started to uh, uh, engage in an active dialogue with our management of why that is the case. And uh, the gender pay gap is just there. You can't un unsee it once you know that it's there. So we brought this point up with uh, division directors, with the management. It has been quite a struggle. 
first I was naive. I always thought that this uh, subject matter was largely communicated, etc. And, and, and I no longer think that. It's it's uh, not debated widely enough. It's not communicated widely enough. Without, uh, but you need hard data. Without the hard, without hard data, you won't see it. It's there. Exactly, 16%. 16.% is the check average of gender pay gap. Uh, within the same department, the average gender pay gap is 10%. In the EU, we now have 16.4% gender pay gap. Uh, in the EU, it's 13%. When the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs started their gender pay gap uh, program, uh, it was more than what it is today. So things are improving. You spoke about your epiphany, how it, how it was a breakthrough moment with you. Uh, when you received this management, the, the, the data, uh, what did it tell you about your company or those issues? The, the, the metrics you follow? Well, there were quite a few epiphanies. First, I joined Plzeňský Prazdroj. It was three and a half years ago. It's not my uh, area of responsibility, uh, but I still thought, you know, this is something that I'd ra like to get involved in within Plzeňský Prazdroj. I felt that something is not quite right there. So we started with a survey survey so of all our employees, male and female, two-thirds of our people work in production. We ask them quite a detailed set of questions. Uh, we ask them whether they thought we, we all had the same opportunities, whether they thought they were being rewarded equally for the wo work they do, and so on. And then we compared the results, what women think and what men think, what men think. And there was a group of people within the company that shared my views, but still, even pre with, when presented with hard data, uh, the majority of our people resisted the idea of gender pay gap being there. But then we presented them with the data from this particular survey, and it finally opened their eyes. Uh, only about 50% of women felt they had equal pay and equal opportunity within our company. And the other half thought that there was a pay gap and they did not have uh, equal opportunity. And uh, amongst men, only 5% thought that the company was being unfair in, in those two respects. The rest of the men thought everything was just fine. Plus, there are other aspects to consider, such as barriers in career development and so on and so forth. So, based on all that, we initiated a massive discussion, even though it was during the pandemic, we decided that this is so urgent, it will not uh, take any postponement. We started discussing with the levels from B1, B2 upwards. By and large, the discussion was not going so pleasantly. The one aspect of why this was so hard to 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 talk about openly was that men think that they are being pointed, uh, they're having a, a finger pointed at them. Uh, and women think that they have been uh, uh, drawing the shorter end of the stick uh, for a long time. So after the survey, we did our own uh, remuneration assessment, and not even those results were particularly uh, favorable or pleasing for us to be confronted with. Uh, so finally, we decided to uh, make up the biggest gaps just to throw money at it, at the gap, and we decided to do it, uh, and we did it. It cost us. And there was another uh, epiphany, not quite so pleasant. Uh, some of the me uh, 
we invested uh, or we allocated uh, money uh, into the merit fund, which is uh, which is uh, uh, the discretionary fund that for bonuses uh, and for making up uh, wage discrepancies uh, that are man managed. These funds are managed by individual managers, and we found that after we increased the contribution to the merit fund, the discrepancies were even greater. When you do, uh, when you deal with this net pay gap, you have to be under 11 percent. We are presently are having done all those measures and uh, investment. We are at around three percent of net pay gap. Well, I do not want to repeat what Pavlina said. I could because we are on a similar uh, course. Uh, many of things uh, at our end are still in progress. This year, we engaged in a similar debate on diversity and women's representation. Like I said, we recruit slightly more women than men. Um, as new employees and we uh, promote them. We have data to prove it. And because we mark our employees, our people, in a similar way that they do in school, so we find that women are better students, if you will, slightly. But well, come to the senior level management, and you don't see as many women there. You see single units of percent or maximum, you know, low double digits in the most optimistic scenario. And we found similar, uh, a similar thing that uh, women think that uh, they're being hard done, but men think that we are, uh, that they are doing everything they can to accommodate women. Women think that they are not being assertive enough, that they are not, uh, they do not want to compromise on family time, etc. So mutual finger pointing, basically, and we have identified a number of aspects. Um, we have quite a high number of uh, uh, men in senior management. Many of them have children, and again, many of those children are uh, daughters. So we try this line of argument with them. Do you want your daughter to be paid less for the work she does vis-a-vis -vis their male colleagues in the future? And also, oh, we uh, accentuate family and parenthood. So we try to encourage our men uh, to make the time once or twice a week to uh, to go and pick up their kids from the kindergarten from school instead of their wife, which helps to cultivate uh, not only uh, release their wives' uh, burden a little bit, but it also cultivates the culture, uh, the environment a bit, because uh, here many women, once they reach management a management position after about five or six years with the company, they hold, they suspend their careers until they're done with child rearing and then they come back. But they uh, advance slower than before because they do not want to take on too much. They don't. They fear that they won't be as good. They are afraid to ask for more money. They are, are afraid to ask for a promotion in many cases. Um, men do not see failure as acutely, do not ascribe it that much value as women do. So that's also a difference between the two. Following up on this, on the subject of second shift, um, this is something that again comes up in a, a, a lot in our discourse. So, uh, our women employees uh, not only that they want to, to put their best in at work, but then they they know that they have another shift ahead of them at home. 
Uh, so it's very hard to balance that. And we also have managers, men who have uh, three or four children. They have the service, uh, you know, round the clock from their wives. They do not have to lift a finger. So we make them realize that they are kind of dependent on, the, on their wives in that that way. And we also try to reduce the gender pay gap naturally. When a new um, recruits come, I see that women are clearly afraid to ask for the money they they deserve, That the money that, that comes with the position. Sometimes I have to ask the, the poor lady, you know, shouldn't you be asking for more? This rarely happens with men. So it's also down to the conditions. Um, and a certain fee uh, notion of self-worth. Just a sh two short points. Uh, as you said, Martina, about helping. Uh, for instance, we have a group of mothers uh, that uh, and, and we uh, just plainly banned some some expressions such as uh, he's helping you with your child or he's looking after your child it's just, uh, no one uh, can ever utter these things in our in our group but uh, obviously there is a certain uh, situation uh, on the societal level and there is also uh, a situation within or internal to the company. Have you have your surveys and research really uh, come across any other reasons or pointers why pay gap exists? Well, if uh, people ask for less than they are worth. Uh, on the job interview, we have a salary plan that goes that is attached to the position, and we will make up uh, to the right level. Wake up the pay to the right level. Especially mothers of smaller children often feel guilty that they are not there for the children. Uh, when in their work or that they are not such a, a, as good an employee as a man because they have to think of, of their children and be there for them. So often women underestimate themselves, their value as employees. As, uh, unless you implement rules uh, that are binding on the managers, this will not work for many reasons. One is how recruitment is set up and the optics of uh, the management, what the management is looking for. Uh, management often looks for experience, relevant experience, but does not see the potential in, in uh, the candidate. Uh, and also after apparently women do have a gap in a career but they may have a lot of potential uh, again women must not be seen as a homogeneous group and they often are unfortunately there are women who want a career uh, they just need the right conditions and they just need some nudging in the right direction and so does the management they need to be nudged as well uh, and then there are women who want to be stay-at-home mothers uh, or they want to be more a mother than a worker uh, so some people need an assertiveness development course. Some people need a, a company kindergarten, a company nursery. We all need different things. 
uh, we have a talent program in our company. We did uh, like a stock take of uh, our talent pool and our admission conditions. So we and I found we only have one third of women there, to two, two thirds of men. So we thought in the talent pool it's one to two women to men and uh, we recruit more women and we promote more women so our first uh, um, suggestion first idea was to make it 50 50 in the talent pool but then i thought you know let's not be so blunt with our actions we must uh, take it on a case by case basis every woman everyone uh, has different needs some women are happy to reach a certain level, take a break for child rearing, and then come back and then see where it takes them. And some women want their career to roll ahead, whether they are uh, with children or not. So we want uh, to create conditions that are suited to ev everyone. And we also want to overcome biases. because. Both these main two approaches that I have outlined are fine with us. Both are valid, and we just we must just create conditions for for both categories of women to feel good and comfortable with us. For us and for other women and other businesses, it's all all boils down to flexibility and then you run into a rigid corporate system you have uh, reporting obligations you don't know whether you can uh, split uh, jobs into two part-time jobs etc and I'm not doing it alone I have a whole team to assist me and it's still quite a chore Thinking of quotas, thinking of any percentages, well, we can all discuss that, but unless we, our systems, our organizations are flexible enough to accommodate that, we can talk all day long and nothing will happen. So there is a lot of, lot of uh, work still ahead of us, and I'd like to solicit some ideas from you how to do it better or do you have any ideas what else to do i'm turning now to our audience do you have any experiences with uh, uh, pay gap have you been affected by pay gap have you been paid less than a male colleague no one or do you ever feel that in your present career or in your previous career you didn't ask for uh, more money, that you should have asked for more money? Thank you. Do you want to share any insights from your own company's organization's culture? on the pay gap and pay transparency issue. I just follow up on what uh, Madame Lenka said. We are now in the phase which you said you have been through already. Uh, pay gap is being uh, declared left and right. I can feel it everywhere, but not in my own company, in my own organization. So uh, I hope that in a year or two, I'll be able to tell you that we have identified pay gap and we, had, we have uh, killed it. We as a corporation are also pushed into uh, benchmarking ourselves against uh, some data we don't know who we're being compared with. But uh, what I see, there is a very thin line between discrimination, for instance, 
you know, if you if you are recruiting or if you have a, a competition for an open position, you uh, you cannot discriminate against, uh, let's say, a, a black man. But then again, you have to uh, find a uh, fine nuance. You just you, well, what you probably mean is that you it you cannot let it uh, be dogmatic. Correct. We do not have it as a duty. We do not see it. It being uh, increasing the number of uh, women in management. We. We don't see it as a duty. We uh, we see it as a goal. In the past, in the life of what, in the light of what the management expected and how we broached the subject, in the past, uh, it's not that men were better and women were not encouraged enough, but we just did not look for uh, the most suitable candidate. Let's say uh, a candidate applying for a position in our beverages division and they did not have um, a relevant experience in beverages, they would not make it to the shortlist. But then we revamped our recruitment parameters and we did not ask at all times for relevant experience and then it was a man against a woman often. The job ultimately went to the best suited candidate, but to get women at least to the, a competitive position, it was very difficult. It's also about how much attention you give the subject. We have to openly ask ourselves the question, why we do not promote enough women? Why are they not looking for employment with us? Why do they not advance? And then only then you can start doing something. I am from MSD. You uh, spoke about uh, recruiting women, especially young women. I'm from the VUT uh, University, the Technical University, and we have an ongoing partnership with uh, Pilsenski Prastroy. And originally I was interested in manufacturing uh, and I did not uh, find uh, the manufacturing sector welcoming enough for me as a woman. That's why I moved to IT. Uh, when I went to interviews, they asked me, okay, you uh, shortly after graduation, well, then I'm married and I kind of predetermined me. I was worried that in uh, um, such an industry, they will prefer at the end of the day, a man, one of my male fellow students, just because he will not uh, start thinking about children. And uh, when I was uh, asked how much money I w am looking to earn at interviews, then I had no idea. I mean, uh, in different interviews in different companies, the tentative uh, figures were so vastly different. I didn't know what I should be asking. So maybe you can start partnerships with universities and uh, foster young uh, female talent there so that the women are more assertive, more self-confident. Women are often afraid to speak up for themselves. And secondly, I'm curious to see what the feedback of men 
to your findings. I work for MSD now. We are a friendly company, very inclusive. That's why we're here. But over lunch, you often hear that, uh, you know, especially our male colleagues think that uh, the society uh, at large uh, privileges women, that our company is privileging women, that uh, some jobs are filled with women just because they are women, which is of course not true, but that's the male ego talking, and I, I feel it's such a shame. Just briefly, uh, on pay of graduate students, we 80% of our uh, annual recruitment volume is graduates. So we set a level, a graduate uh, entrance pay level, and uh, then we grant it to all of our recruits. We do not want to trouble them with uh, questions such as how much would you uh, would you pay yourself in this position. For the most senior colleagues, we also employ methods such as mentoring. Women appreciate mentoring. Uh, mentoring is good for a young graduate as well as uh, you know longer serving women employees, for instance. I was in Rota Retreat Weekend. There were 15 of us, uh, executive level management women. And we felt very accomplished after we left because we spent a year, and, uh, a day and a half talking about uh, problems that we all share. That's why we try to employ mentoring, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. We take uh, uh, on uh, external mentoring or external mentors, external mentoring services. Um, and we try to mentor women how to ask for more money, how to achieve better work-life balance. We too have similar projects, and uh, our men call it some women's crying session. But we feel they're needed. We always put things out on the table, out in the open. We can see what uh, can be done, and we will continue to have these crying sessions until those things that uh, un until those grievances are not res are, are resolved, and. So we're constantly engaged in a dialogue. Uh, we always uh, discuss whether we are on the right track. But from the direction of the women who are concerned with these problems, we feel we are on the right uh, tracks. For our graduate program, we have an entry level uh, pay to for, for new graduates. And we often. Uh, counsel students uh, about their uh, career opportunities because not everyone has a clear-cut idea about what they want to do. Some people know exactly what they do not want to do, but they are not quite so sure of what they want to do out of the options that are before them. So we try to point them also in the, di in the right direction. I would have loved to be to, to have received such help when I was a young graduate or, or, or a student. Good afternoon, Adela Malinova. I am from Moneta. I am. Uh, I work under Clara Oskova, one of the panelists. Uh, at our bank, uh, the topic resonates very much, and I. I feel that we all have the same problem, we share the problem. Following up on what was last said, the impact of the programs, of the action plans is that men 
or the consequence is that uh, women are getting something extra. But it's not something extra, it's just that a gap is being closed. And uh, I deal with employees' path through our organization from the recruitment to termination. So I see the whole life cycle and uh, the situation is clearly changing. Oh, women graduates are becoming more assertive and they're asking for more money and the men are complacent. They do not see any pay gap. But women at least are getting more vocal and they're asking for money. Or take mums. Uh, the situation of mums at a workplace is very individual. Let's say uh, a mother is leaving her position uh, to be with... Uh, to be with her child, she thinks, you know, I'll be back in two years, and then she finds that after a year, she's getting bored at home, she, she can handle working as well as uh, child rearing, and she wants to go back, back to the workplace, or, or, another, or another woman thinks she'll be back uh, to work soon, and then she suddenly finds she prefers to stay at home looking after her kid. So. Obviously, uh, this has changed uh, for the better the situation uh, in the labor market is helping to integrate uh, mothers and fathers um, into the workplace because they can be an enormous value to the team. Not all managers see it. Some managers think that, you know, uh, mothers cannot be relied upon, etc. But others want to bring their mothers uh, back to the workplace. And uh, it's best if we show everyone the range of options that exist. They can learn they, they can learn what is possible, they can see what can work for themselves and make the right choice. We have been measuring gender pay gap for five years at, on an annual basis. We have 1.97% uh, pay gap, net pay gap, but this has been this has followed after some major discussions. Obviously, most management in senior and executive level are men. So the men get the data on their tables. They have to take opinion on it. They have to act on it. Uh, so it's often very difficult, but uh, clearly we are moving forward. Those things are uh, interconnected vessels, but on the other hand, uh, there are two phenomena of the same round. Ge gender pay gap is a main prerequisite for um, managing everything. If you do not have uh, equal pay, you know, you c cannot succeed as a company. You will always be limiting your own potential. For instance, when we ran our survey, We uh, got the results. We improved the situation, acting on these results, and uh, but then we thought, you know, 
why will we why should we be congratulating ourselves for doing something that should be a matter of course that is not anything special or should not be anything special uh, so you need to take approaches from this angle uh, in order to make your endeavors successful we have our own problems. Plzeňský Prastroj is still a, a traditional conservative company. People have been used to a, a, a set way of running things for 20, 10 years. Now, times are clearly changing. Well, we have to uh, give those people time to adapt. But people always want to fit in. Either you adapt or you're out. So it's very important to set clear rules of conduct, of behavior. And if they, if somebody breaks these rules, they get a warning. Um, this what we call microaggression uh, can be very detrimental to company culture. They undermine the company culture and they uh, drag the company down. Yes, indeed, the discourse is clearly changing uh, and the sharing of our ex respective experiences is helping that for instance a, a mom uh, will benefit from seeing other women in her in the workplace enjoying these various options how to be uh, how to contribute to the company for, for instance uh, uh, I have some experience from a company like PwC. It was very difficult to break through a certain glass ceiling that was there up until you, uh, you know, at, at a certain level. Uh, but if you want to have a career and, and be a mother, have one, two, three children, uh, it shows that uh, things are changing because more and more women well, uh, aspire and uh, get to management positions with children, uh, but uh, the ones who go first, the ones who break the uh, uh, break the ice, are usually the ones that are that have it the hardest. That uh, um, also women who. want to participate in the workplace should be given options such as remote working etc they should that they will do their best to uh, do their work correctly and uh, their managers uh, should not insist on having them coming come to the office because a, a competent manager can manage you remotely or or in the office on just just the same terms. So we should make that a part of uh, the explanatory discourse that, and it's not only about women, even men can have a special need or special situa life situation. They, they will require more flexibility on the part of their employer. If uh, uh, we uh, see that the prevalent group thing that you know we you do not recruit women around 30 because she she just wants to get employed and then go off, have a have a child and and then and another so those things are still surviving i i'm curious how to uproot this uh, malpractice uh you know, for me, a man who just thinks of changing a career or changing an employee carries okay, the same risks as a, as a young woman who may or may not be a mother. 
Well, I want to bring this discussion down to a very uh, to a point I very much liked, and that is uh, looking for potential in people. Uh, for instance, uh, women uh, planning to be mothers also have potential, uh, and it is a way, uh, in a way, a potential to be a mother. So, bringing this angle into discussion. Uh, always um, uh, makes it rather explosive. That's why uh, I always argue with men, how would you feel if that was your own daughter who wanted to be a mother, who, wa who also wanted to have a career, and she would be constantly turned away from, from job interviews? You know, it should be a, a matter of principles. Too. We should set uh, set rules so that these discussions do not perpetuate forever. Perhaps I have it uh, slight. We have it slightly simpler in the way that because we do personal assessments every year. We are basically like a pyramid scheme. If you if you do your job right with an acceptable terms, then you will advance at least a little bit every year. And we know that women, some of them, are bound to leave, to bear children. For instance, I had a, I had a colleague, female colleague, she was appraised in June, we knew that she would be leaving. It was no secret, and we still promoted her. Maybe I'm blind. I have a blind spot to this, but uh, uh, to this, but in our company, I think this is quite resolved. This, is, uh, but as for the potential, there is learning, but inspiration. This is something that we do not have, and that goes both ways. There is a prejudice of people who are judging, but also the prejudice of the the women themselves because they uh, sometimes feel they, you know, they, in addition to the work they do, they feel sometimes reluctant to work on themselves and work on the teams. We have the last ten minutes, uh, and we have uh, two questions to address. So. Let's get to it. MSD. I am also from MSD. I have two questions. Do you think that we will ever get to the point that any check postings will, come, uh, job postings will, uh, every job posting will come with, with uh, the salary advertised? You, uh, oft, you often see job ads that go, give a range. But often they are advertised without any idea of the salary whatsoever. Um, I work in IT and I see uh, how differently women are seen or treated because we are still, as women, not uh, seen as a naturally or as having a natural affinity with technical. Uh, disciplines. I am, you know, I, I'm a Gen Z, and uh, I was always been uh, fond of maths, and I did statistics, etc. And everybody was scratching their heads over, over me, and saying, "How come you know, you're a girl? You're not meant to like these things." And so, do you have any partnerships with universities? Do you help girls to technical professions? Yes, we do, but my general rule is that you have to tidy up your own room before you tell anybody else to. Because we do not want to uh, attract talented young women, and then they will be faced with some grim reality. So we have to first uh, clean up. And uh, when we have young, talented women, we offer them 
various opportunities. We send them for a, a year-long paid internship. It's very popular. But obviously, availability depends on uh, the particular area or discipline. Some disciplines are more naturally uh, leaning towards these internships. But we make for the consumer, and uh, our main product, beer, is no longer the exclusive domain of men. For instance, we have a, a wonderful program for uh, for uh, bartenders. men as well as women. So we want to change the culture, change the way women are seen all along our chain, from manufacturing through to distribution in pubs, bars, etc., all the way to the consumer. We have quite a lot of international recruitment in the Slovak market, we must advertise for jobs, vacancies with the salary. Obviously, I would like all job postings to be uh, to be advertised with salary. It uh, managers managers generally are against it. It is hard for them sometimes, but. Uh, All the same, it should be like that. And uh, with the B two B managers, we are, we also have a product. We also have people uh, in the company branded cars. We are connected with uh, the brand, so that's why. We, so we are quite visible vis a vis to the customer. We uh, sponsor students. We we have other interesting activities for for young people for young talent. We have mixed teams. And from that pool of young talent, we have picked three, between three and four young people, and we are sort of cultivating them, uh, developing them internally. Marketa Skokanova, I'm from Deloitte. I uh, work in human capital consulting, and I wanted to uh, uh, resonate on uh, this previous question. Do you think that uh, advertising for jobs with a salary published, I think this uh, obviously is against those who are assertive and who will are, uh, not fear asking for money. Um, also, when we uh, join, or it is common practice in the company, when you when you start a new company, you sign a document, a contract, or it's a part of your work contract, that you will not sh uh, discuss your pay uh, terms, your salary terms, with your colleagues. So uh, what do you plan to do about that? Well, and it comes to f for job classifieds, for job, job advertising, Uh, this will uh, also impinge on uh, competition, not only internal competition, but also external competition. But I'm in favor for it, all in all. For the second part of your question, I'm 50-50 on why, 50-54 uh, and 50-50 against, uh, let's say. Um, what I'd like to see published is the, let's say, a salary range for a specific position. And then maybe some details on promotion um, requirements. I'm not sure whether I'd like to see the final salary published. I'm, I don't have a clear opinion on that. But a range, definitely. 
I think uh, pay transparency, so job uh, in the spirit of that uh, advertising with salaries will probably come in the future. But uh, as part of performance review, which uh, evaluates you and your bonuses depending on it, then it sh should involve uh, company-wide scaling so that it balances out of uh, the effect of men heavy teams against women or teams of women. So as for the remaining of your questions, I believe that it's well taken care of, at least in this in the realm of larger corporations in and in this country. Um, but the situation in smaller companies may be different. Finally, let me read you with a th uh, uh, thought shared to me by Schalke Hofre, the lawyer. Why are we talking about how to get women into the lucrative careers, but why are not we take, uh, talking about how to uplift uh, those professions where women are required, such as caregiving, nursing, etc. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you at one of the next Business for Society events.